So right. if you want, I can go into a little bit about what we're doing today. Yes, please go ahead, Dan. So uh, for the viewers out there, uh, first we dove with the, uh, this morning we dove, went to the top of the hill, uh, the seamount, and took a look uh, at there. We saw uh, a great number of uh, fish up there, which was kind of a rare sight to see. Uh, map that, see, map that up there, and really got an idea of what what kind of growth was happening at the top. And then they started down and did an orbit scan all the way down the side of the um, sea cliff, um, sea mount, and now they made it to the bottom here, which is where they just finished on the second ship. And now we have a complete map. Um, I don't know if it's up there on satellite. It is three. still up there. Yes, so it is. See, you can see the last portions of that, which is what we just completed, and all those pixely little things. The little boxes. The boxes kind of show you the slope. So now we're gonna start heading up the slope. So we're looking for areas that have, you know, high outcroppings or that have no pixels in them because they're probably caves or that type of stuff. And that's where we're gonna find cool things. So as we go up, we're gonna use the Norbit scan, investigate a bunch of those things as we continue up the slope for this uh, watch standard. Let's, um, towards that end, maybe let's start out in the box where Atalanta is facing 225, Hercules gets in front of it, 225, we all head in the same direction and then from there we can deviate. Um, just because of that steep slope there, that way we'll get ourselves all sort sorted. So Zach, I have a question in the chat. They say they keep seeing white floaters and they can't tell if it's snow or not. They're wondering if it could be linked to the rat tails because they think some of the sizes of it, of the white floaters are a little bigger than usually marine snow. I think it might just be zooplankton or jellyfish, kind of like little ones floating around. Yeah, I think typically, um, yeah, it's made of a lot of different types of zooplankton, right? Um, there's there's thousands of species out there, so some big, some small. I mean, big when we're talking, we're talking, you know, a couple millimeters, right? Yeah. We're not talking very big, but relatively, um, yeah. And and you know, these plankton, they don't really control where they go so much. They kind of go where the water takes them. So we might just be in the be in a zone of heavy of of one concentration. Um, those animals also reproduce very fast. A lot of them have just a couple day lifespans, right? And they yeah. they're reproducing. They you know live a, live a week or two and then they move on. So, and I think that's a common misconception a lot of people have is that plankton means small. But yeah. plankton doesn't really have a size requirement to it, right? Like right. Uh, you can get plankton that's actually salp, so it's in a chain and can be as large as a whale. Yep. It's just plankton means unable to move on their own. They're at the yeah. mercy of the currents. Of yeah, and some people, they, um, I've heard some people say it's a specific, like, speed against the current they can't swim. Yeah. So they'll, they'll even consider, like, jellyfish plankton because yeah. they can't really control so much. And that's why sometimes, you know, when you get one jellyfish washed up on a beach, you get a lot of them because they're all floating together. It's not like one just lost track with the other or such. So, yeah, plankton is an interesting other world. It's, it it's is. an entire other world under the ocean. And so much of the marine ecosystem depends yes. on that plankton. Travis, what techniques are most accurate for aging deep sea corals? Wow, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, probably the best would be radiometric dating with carbon-14. So you're looking at uh, using these uh, radioactive carbon decay as a, as a measure for um, when something was first formed. Um, so these sort of radioisotopes can be pretty useful. The, o the other interesting thing is that um, many corals kind of grow like tree rings, so you can sort of look through and uh, look at uh, sort of how fast they've grown through time. And I'm not sure um, for deep sea corals uh, how common that is and how conserved it is across all the taxa. One of the things that's pretty difficult yeah. uh, with some of these deep sea corals is that whereas sort of the more shallow corals build these really big, hard skeletons. A lot of the deep sea corals are kind of what we would more commonly refer to as soft corals. So they have sort of other things mixed in with their skeleton as well. So it makes them a little bit more flexible. Uh, and that's part of a, sort of their mechanism to be able to move a little bit with the currents and sort of stretch out a little bit faster and not have to build everything from, from those hard rocks. And then Rachel, do you have a moment for a question? 
Yes. All right. So I have a viewer asking to please explain what is being shown on channel three. So Sure. Um, so what you're seeing on channel three is this is an actual real-time visualization of the Norbit uh, multi-beam mapping data. So um, on the ROV itself, we have a multi-beam sonar. It's a you know transducer to transmits and also receives sound. So it's a it's basically it sends out all these individual sonar beams in a fan-shaped pattern. And what we're doing is we're taking the actual raw returns. So see like those. Um, Basically, you see like individual boxes. You can think of those as like, like in an image, you have pixels, you know, so um, the, because this is like an image is 2D. So you say, oh, OK, pixel is short for pixel element. Um, so since the, you know, seabed is three dimensions, uh, they're actually boxes instead of individual points. But what's happening is that so what you're so what you're seeing there is this is the actual real-time visualization of that. So uh, on the front side of Herc, um, it's a little bit uh, very close to the left side, the port side manipulator arm that you saw when uh, Dan was uh, manipulating the knife and freeing the vehicle earlier. So what's happening is is that that sonar is actually measuring the contour of the terrain underneath Herc. And we are able to actually pull that data over the fiber that uh, comes back up to the ship. And topside, we have a computer that's what we're doing is, is we're taking the returns from the multi beam and we're taking the position that Herc was at and it's, um, you know, at the heading that it's going on. And, and we're able to pull all of that together and actually put together a, uh, you know, a real time 3D rendering of that. So that's what you're seeing. And Rachel did a lot of that programming, too, to help with the real-time data, right? So it's very impressive. I wish I had Rachel's mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's actually... Um, so what's really interesting about this dive is that there are... If we're looking at turning the you know, the actual real seabed into a you know, computer model that we can interact with, uh, there's actually two technologies that we're using simultaneously. Uh, the, so the Norbit is is a multi-beam sonar. So that's using actually so that's using sound to to um, to measure the seafloor. But the other technology that we're using in parallel, this is and that's actually like it's literally happening right now. Uh, I hit the start command about a minute ago. Um, so we're using a combination of Norbit is acoustic, whereas the Triclops wide field camera system is based upon light. It's a you know it's a camera. And with that, we're able to use it. So for the Triclops, we're able to use a technique called photogrammetry, where we have two cameras that are located um, at a defined position apart. And just like our, like, you know, so if you put your hand in front of your face, you know, your brain is able to use your depth perception and say, oh, okay, well, you know, I have five fingers and my hand is about a foot away from my face. Um, so the, the uh, photogrammetry software that we're using is basically, it's doing the same thing as your brain. You know, you, you've got two eyes and that gives you depth perception. So the, uh, one of the goals of this cruise is that, you know, we, we have two different technologies that are measured, that are giving us the shape of the seabed. We've got the acoustics from the Norbit multi-beam and we've got the photogrammetry from the Triclops wide field camera. And what we want to be able to use is use those two techniques and reference them against each other so that if there's, uh, you know, different technologies have different limitations. So if there, if one of them has a weak spot, that we can um, make them work together as a team. Okay. And how long, we keep talking about how this is real time. Before we came up with these new programs that you helped write to make it real time, how long would to create something like this take? Well, so the, one of the things to keep in mind is actually, so getting this kind of, uh, getting this kind of data in the past was a real challenge because if we look at the, so if we, um, because Herc is so close to the seabed, we're able to get very high resolution features. As opposed to when we use multi-beam from Nautilus before for like the mapping expeditions? Exactly. So the, so if you look at the, the strengths and weaknesses of, of uh, the two approaches, so Herc is, so uh, right now, uh, what are, what's our, our depth is a thousand meters. Thousand okay. Meters, yep. So the thing to keep in mind about the different ways we can get this data is, uh, so Nautilus, we have a, we have a multi-beam sonar on the ship that we could turn on, 
but the issue is that our ship is a thousand meters above the seabed, mm -hmm. whereas Herc is Herc's altitude is maybe a five meters. So the there's a the, in engineering and in science we have a trade-off called range versus resolution. Um, so the so Nautilus, you know, underway is is easily capable of moving eight to ten knots. We can you know we can cover large relatively large areas of space. But in a deep water area like this, you know, we're a thousand meters above the seafloor, and so we have we have we have the range. We can cover a lot of uh, we can cover a lot of square miles in a given day. But one of the problems we have is because we're relatively far, I mean, we're a kilometer above the seabed. You know, we don't necessarily have the um, really high accuracy that a that something closer to the seabed would have. But the problem is is that Herc moves at maybe 0 0.2 knots. So Herc has extremely high resolution, but limited range, whereas Nautilus has high range, but limited resolution in a deep water environment. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. I have an interaction later, too, where I have to cover mapping, so you made it make a lot more sense for me as well. Thanks. Just to build on that a little bit, one of the things that's really amazing about this combination is that when you use the 3D photogrammetry from the images, you can not only create the model, but also overlay on top of that the imagery itself. So you can see what's driving these changes in small scale structure. And that's one of our big interests here from the University of Puerto Rico is trying to see um, sort of those biological uh, drivers of, of structure on the sea floor, because these um, sort of very small sc or fine scale habitat uh, can be really uh, valuable for for all the little things crawling around on the bottom. Okay, uh, Science Row, just to let you know, we are getting all sorted up here. Chris has just uploaded um, that multi-beam pass that we had uh, going down slope. Uh, I've loaded in it, that into our ROV navigation. So we are now headed um, over to some somewhat more interesting terrain than we are on right now. Uh, no promises. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Uh, All right, yeah. thank you. And we, do, we know that there's some better, st a little bit of a steeper thing upslope, but um, as, we, as we go, as we travel, we're just gonna pick and choose a little bit. Um, if you do actually ROV nav, I don't know if you have that as an option. Yeah, that's the one that has the high-res map on it. Front row, could we do some introduction for you guys up there? Sure, this is Renato Kane. I'm the navigator on this watch. And I've been sailing on Nautilus for... This is my cruise number 69. Been on for 10 years. Sometimes they let me off. <laughs> All right, and head on over to Simon. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sorry, Simon. They're asking for intros there. Yeah, he's uh, piloting. Give us a oh. second here. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. Uh, up in where you are, uh, TJ Scanlon, uh, Atlanta pilot here. Uh, southwest of Ireland, been with Nautilus coming on a year now. And, uh, yeah, every day is a new experience. Enjoying it. Over to you, Dave. Hi, Dave Robertson, uh, video. Uh, this is, uh, let's see, I've been on Nautilus since 2016. And uh, this is my fourth leg out here this season. Um, and if you have any questions about the video systems, other than uh, track laps, which is, uh, is fancy stuff I don't get to play with, but that's all right. <laughs> any questions about the video system or how we're doing things or that kind of stuff, just uh, send them my way. All right, it looks like we have a viewer from the Big Island. They're saying aloha. They see them from our, their house right now. Um, I live on Oahu, so I really love this ocean view looking at Big Island has been really nice. 
Um, and then we had a question about what is the frilly thing in the bottom right of channel one. I think we've moved on from that, but I think what you're seeing was the the butt of a ratfish, I think was what we're kind of looking like. You're looking at the tail and that is what kind of made it look frilly. So you live on Oahu now, uh, but I heard you say that you uh, spent some time in Alaska? I did, yeah. Um, I spent quite a few years going, I, I used to say I migrated with the whales, you know, and um, for a while there I was doing fisheries biology work on boats, and I still actually go up to Alaska in the summer. My boyfriend's a fisherman, so we actually started a small business where we take his fish and sell in Hawaii because best time to best time to be there in the summer. Yeah, June is the best month. <laughs> yes, I agree because yep. it's like you still have the melt of the snow and you get starts when all the wildflowers pop up and it's just really beautiful time of year to go. Maximum to Alaska. daylight. And maximum daylight. Yes. I'm from Anchorage. <laughs> oh, okay, nice. I've spent quite a bit of time in Anchorage. And I've uh, spent uh, time through, through various jobs. I've been lucky enough to be pretty much everywhere in the state. Yeah. Uh, all the way up north, all the way out west, mm -hmm. down in the chain. Been to Dutch a lot of times. Oh, I've been to Dutch Harbor plenty of time. Yeah. I've actually been all the way out to Atu. I haven't been that far. And Atu and ADAC. So yeah. ADAC is um, kind of looks like a post apocalyptic town. It's like an old abandoned military base and you can actually yep. still go into the base and we might have made some goofy videos of us pretending the world ended. I can't imagine doing that. <laughs> uh, I've been to Southeastern. I've been to the 7,000 foot base camp on Denali. Uh, been to the farthest north point uh, in the United States, which is Point Barrow. Mm. Where's the furthest south point in the United States? The furthest south point? Isn't that um, Hawaii, the south point of Oh, a Bingo. big island. Yeah. yeah. Very close to where we are. Right where we are. There's your Alaska trivia for today. <laughs> Back to oceanography. And Alaska is also the most eastern and western point. Are these uh, xenophyophores? True. Are up there? Um, biologists in the back row. Those little clusters. Am I mistaken in that identification? Sorry, what was that? Right? I was looking was up. The xenophyophores. There's, the, there's these tiny little clusters we've been seeing. Of these like single cellular, um, I'll let you know when I see another okay. one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Rachel, here's a question in the chat for you. What operating system are we using here? All right. Wow, that is uh, probably a, well the first time that question has been asked on Nautilus Live. <laughs> um, most of the most of the systems on the ship uh, run on Ubuntu. Uh, we generally 2004, 2204, the Ubuntu server. We are definitely, uh, generally speaking, big Linux fans here. There are a couple systems, especially some, like most of our like in-house code, you know, on, on uh, Nautilus runs on Ubuntu Linux. But gener there are a couple, um, some of the instrumentation where the like the manufacturer, if there's a computer top side, uh, like for example. The, there's a sonar on Hurricane Atalanta, and uh, the 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 multi-beam sonar is mounted on Nautilus EM302. Um, there is a lot of instrumentation where the the manufacturer has a specific program to control it. Uh, those machines usually run on Windows. I personally am not very fond of Windows. I think that if you want something to run, you know, long term and reliably in a harsh environment, you should run it on Linux. I'm surprised anything still runs on Windows, actually. I yeah, uh, I know it's it it's tough. It's uh, definitely one of the harder parts of the job is keeping all the, especially with the updates. You yeah. know, I mean, there there there's some secret ways to like really truly lock out Windows updates, but yeah, um. all of our. Uh, all of the like the critical code for Triclops runs on Linux. Yeah. Why is Linux so much more preferred? So a lot of it is. There is um, first off, it, it's built to be very easy to develop on. So even if you like, even if you don't have a Linux computer on like your desktop or your laptop, many of the devices like um, it used to be like like the TiVo runs on Linux. Uh, you know, Android is basically a Linux derivative. 
a lot of smart TVs, a lot of things like that are Linux based. Um, I think that with Linux, there's a there's sort of a separation of you know like you, uh, Windows 10 and Windows 11. So you hit the start menu, right? There's all these like little tiles and screens and all this just like stuff that's you know meant to be attention getting, and it's like oh here's the latest news. Yeah. So I think Microsoft tends to just put a lot of stuff in there because it makes it look flashy. But, you know, like you hit the start menu and it's like, oh, my computer's trying to go to the BBC and, you know, 20 different websites, which is not stuff that we want to do when we're trying to drive an ROV. <laughs> so um, can you explain some of the benefits of why people should maybe learn just a little bit about programming and how someone would go about if they want to learn about programming? Um, well, I would say one of the benefits is that the path that got me here started with my high school computer club. Yeah. Uh, so if, you know, if, if maybe you're a Nautilus Live listener and you're, you know, if you're interested in any, the offshore world and especially science, you know, the, that was the path that I ended up taking. Um, I mean, a lot of times the Nautilus Live will talk about either the, the, oh, the piloting of the a, ROVs um, or the, you know, the science, whether it's biology or the geology or the maybe the chemical oceanography. We talk a lot about the science and the ROVs, but we don't necessarily always talk about the you know the infrastructure like video and um, and data engineering that keeps the ship running. Um, uh, stand by one, Rachel. We have this um, this little type oh, of yeah. uh, squid. I can't recall the name of it, but yeah. we've seen it before. I believe that that's a squid. Otherwise, I might be misidentifying it. Could be a holothurian. It almost does yeah. look a little sea cucumber with yeah. those tentacles on but the end. But we've seen one, it's like got a, I can't recall the name of it now. What should I call this? Floating gelatinous? It's got these two little <laughs> eyes. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm working on it right now to fair. You got the ID one. going on back there. I know I've seen this in like the highlight reels before. Yeah, we have, uh, haven't we? I think it's like. Is it a squid? Yeah, what kind of squid is it, though? Let's see. Or is it your favorite sea cucumber, Jonathan? <laughs> I think it is a squid. I just can't remember the name. We do have yeah, the highlight it's a squid. It is a squid. Nautilus. We have a uh, video of it on one of our highlight reels. I just can't remember what the name is either. It has really big eyes to it, it looks like. Do, are those black balls on the side behind the tentacles, the eyes? I believe those are optical sensors of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> now that it's in the light pool, we could zoom in on it if you want, so. Sure. Oh, there you go, you can see its fins. Do you want to stop the ship move there, Rennie, just if you want to spend a bit of time looking at this? Yeah, we're just held up now, so I'd have to backtrack. Um, the uh, ship is move is complete. Let's see. And, uh, we, might get, we might get tucked Simon, away from it. Your, your tendency as a ROV pilot is going to be to pull away from it as I zoom in because you lose your, uh, yeah, your reference. Yeah, start to get tugged. That's a beautiful image right there. Wow, great wow. shot. Oh, and look, a little shrimp there, too. Really nice. That's, that's well done, Simon. It's hard to... Yeah. Hard to Very nice. That. Zach, do you want to tell still? us a little bit about squid anatomy? Oh, squid anatomy. Yeah, so squid are interesting. Okay, uh, they're members of the cephalopod family. family. Um, and there's there's quite a few species. Um, generally, they're pretty short-lived animals. Um, for the most part, uh, many of uh, cephalopods are. A lot of people think, you know, octopus and squid live for years. Um, a lot of them have just a couple year lifespan. Um, benefit of that is they, they grow very fast and they reproduce fast, so it keeps them healthy and sustainable. Um, but the squid, one of the things that's different from them, obviously from an octopus, is they're swimming up in the water column. Um, so that is that is their, their kind of lifestyle. That's how they've evolved to come off the seafloor. Um, 
just like octopus, they have eight arms, um, but the one thing that they also have is the two tentacles, um, which you don't generally see. They don't really just swim around with them. Um, what's, the, what's the difference between an arm and a tentacle? Oh. And also, the chat is helping us with our ID, saying it's a piglet squid. Piglet squid. Piglet Great. squid, thank, thank you. you. Um, so the difference between an arm and tentacle, um, an arm has multiple purposes, versus a tentacle has a single purpose. So. In the squid, like I said, um, they have two tentacles, and those are specifically just for capturing prey. Uh, whereas those other eight arms, they use, if they do go on the ground, they can crawl around with them as well, and it also captures the prey. Um, so that's actually one of the fun things about um, science is often you hear octopus have eight tentacles. They actually have zero tentacles. They have eight arms, right? And so if you want to be really specific, which is one of those things, it's not always worth correcting people because it's way more fun to say eight tentacles, right? Um, but biology like um, speaking, Technically, um, they're, they're all just eight arms. So, but those, those tentacles are, are quite impressive. They shoot out um, pretty far. They've got the suction cups just there on the tips of it, um, and that's how they're gonna they're gonna pull it in. So, that was a nice little treat for us. I have April from the Big Island who's asking, "What is the most surprising thing we've come across this week, either biological or topographically?" I think for me, I think our watch, we got lucky that we saw the gulper eel. That was pretty incredible biologically wise. Yeah, that, I think that was, you know, very rare. Yes. Um, and then how about anyone else have something else that they really enjoyed seeing this week? Well, I think the pillar lava at the very bottom mm -hmm. on the uh, last first shift, on the first shift, was yeah. really cool. Because yeah. you could see just where the lava came out and cooled and just looked like big pillows. And, how what you think it would be yeah uh, you know what you imagine lava to be when it blows out you know and then i would say you know the the whole sill system where you can see the different lava flows coming over so as we trans trans transition up the hill or the seamount you can see various lava flows coming out yes. and it was very distinct like it just happened but they happened thousands of years ago definitely I think also for, for anyone who was with us earlier today, when we sort of descended to the top of the seamount and there was just the huge, huge school of fish aggregating right at the top, that was yeah. just really impressive just by the sheer numbers. Um, that was pretty fun. There's one of those um, brainy looking things um, to the right of that fish. Um, yeah. I did look, th it does look like those are xenophyophores, so those are single-celled organisms. I know nothing more about them. <laughs> There's also one to the left of the screen as well. It's an impressive um, sounding word though, xenophyophores. Yeah. Anyone who knows anything about biology back there, feel free to chime in. I'm just the I ID guy. <laughs> Zach or Travis, do you know anything about xenophyophores? I know they're a part of the uh, foraminifera. Um, okay. So yeah, like he was saying, single-celled. Um, they're kind of cool though for um, for being. Um, remember the the foraminifera? They're kind of like a hard hard material. Like um, a lot of the single cells are right, soft and squishy type. These guys actually form um, mm -hmm. form a hard. Have a, a zoom there, Dave. Yeah, I, I don't know if I, if they're more common shallower. I don't often see as many as we've been seeing um, at this depth, but um, we're often in the middle of nowhere, so maybe close to the islands there's some significance there. So we're talking about kind of like almost this kind of brain coral looking thing, right? Is that what we're talking about? That's right, but it's yeah. a, indeed a, a single cell mm -hmm. from my understanding. Yeah. Yeah, and I did just look up because I was curious the depth. Um, so those are typically found between 500 to 10,000 meters. So okay. definitely a, de a deep sea one for sure. I'm sure there's a, you know, a shallow relative. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I just haven't seen them in this abundance. So it's yeah, kinda, that's it's quite a large cluster yeah. there. Yeah, so we've seen so many kind of as we've been going. Yeah. You need the brain coral for that. I'd say that's a solid Halloween <laughs> finding. On my, on Single celled my, brain. On my highlight, though, I, I 
I did my best attempt at spelling, but I might have put into it. I have no idea <laughs> on the spelling. <laughs> That's why I teach science and not English, folks. <laughs> So why didn't the skeleton... It's one of those xylophone types of words. <laughs> I don't know. Because you didn't have the body for it. Ooh. Ooh. Halloween joke. All right, I like it, this. <laughs> I should have looked up some more uh, geology puns last night. I heard Travis has got it. He's got cat facts, though. Do you have a lot of cat facts? <laughs> I'm all from that. Not a lot of cats here in the deep sea, though, Jonathan. Yeah, what should we put up there? We have a question in the chat asking what kind of fish did we find at the top of the seamount. And I think that okay. was rat tail fish, also known as Brenadier fish. Is that correct? Dan, you could probably put, or I'm um, sorry, Dave, you could probably put yeah, the Grenadier other Triclops PC there, but Tell me what I'm not sure. PC that is? Uh, tri. That's, uh, oh, I thought that's, that's what's right next to it. I think they did a... Uh, an extension or a second KVM for that one. I know nothing about this. I'm sorry. I, I don't. I don't either. I apologize. So, Rennie, how far are we from some good stuff that you promised? Oh, I'm sorry. I have trouble hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was that? How far away are we? Um, so we're just at the bottom of this slope here. Um, it seems to be a lot more of the same until we get over to this side feature, which tracks along with our multi-beam bathymetry. It just kind of seems to be the base of this arm um, going up. So I thought on our way up, we would just um, kind of divert over um, to that and then ride that up um, till we see anything else of interest. Um, I think um, just it sounded like that was your intent to kind of come over to uh, to track things in with that we've seen in Norbit. And it looks like the ridge over there is kind of the most significant if you're looking at the ROV nav screen. Yep. Um, looks like this is kind of flat, and then this gets some terrain here. Uh, sounds good. Um, Thank you. That being said, Hercules is starting to ap approach that. I think it's another another ship move out. Um, you guys ready for another one? Okay. Bridge nav. Right. One more step, three zero meters west. Thank you. Sherry says we are not out in the middle of nowhere, so because she's in the White House right above where we're sailing our vessel. She can see us from there. And I agree, Hawaii is not the middle of nowhere. We are in the middle of the Pacific, though. Jonathan? Yes, sir. Uh, I have something called Triclops. It's got a window on it that's not doing anything. It looks like a render. Uh, yeah, that could be it. Okay. If uh, uh, K2 is currently developing. All right. Um, so that doesn't seem to be too useful. So I put Ravnav up. Okay. Uh, but that just repeats what he's got. Yeah, Dan, I can hear you. Go ahead and talk for me. Uh, it is better. Okay, thanks. So, save. So Travis is back there somewhere? Uh, he's on Travis the far wall. Just oh, he stepped out? Oh, he stepped he out? He just That's stepped fine. out, yeah. No worries. Uh, when we were just discussing the dive planning last night, we were looking in this uh, region and um, kind of the area between the two ridges going up to the main ridge. Um, we were curious what we'd see there, and it kind of looks like this talus slope here. Um, a lot has fallen down. It's uh, not a lot of structure material. Um, I was interested in his perspective on that, but we'll see what happens when we come to this ridge. 
This is the same feature that we were diving on. Um, was that yesterday? Yeah, yesterday when we were seeing some of those um, volcanic layers, uh, possibly uh, strata, possibly dikes. Um, so we're on kind of a different, we're on the northern section of it, um, just kind of exploring the extent of, of those types of features and in other interesting features on it. Well, we got a shout out in the chat, and they're saying that they hope we can see some whales. I think a lot of crew members are hoping to see some whales. I think we're right on the cusp of whale season. We may or may not see them. I think they tend to come a little bit later in the year, but you never know. We might have some overachievers that hopefully come by and say hi to us, because that would be pretty awesome. I think Jonathan would really like it if they swam by and said hi to our ROVs for us, especially. And absolutely. <laughs> Fish bioluminescent, or is that ref just reflecting? I would think uh, reflective, just because our um, our camera doesn't really quite pick up on bio bioluminescence, um, even with all our lights out. Renato, here's a question for you. Are we south of the Musician Seamounts? Musician Seamounts. Yeah. Uh, yes, we are. Those are, uh, if I'm not mistaken, just off the top of my head, I believe that those are uh, north of the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands or north of the Hawaiian Islands, kind of between the two. Um, we are south of Big Island right now. Yeah, we're off the south point. But I could have that s swapped. I could have my seamount chains mis mismatched in my head. Oh, Travis is back if you want to ask him your questions. Oh, yeah, Travis, I was just commenting on it looks like um, w when we chose this dive track, we were kind of going in between these two ridges in this kind of hollow here and seeing what we would see. It looks like a lot of kind of tailless slope falling down and um, some still, still some hard substrate for sessile. Bio, uh, biology, but um, seems to be a little less um, abundant than the ridges that we were seeing the other day. But I, I was curious of your take on it. Yeah, sure. So uh, one of the things that uh, we can see with some of this talus and also in some of the previous reports is um, these are geologically quite young and this is a very active area with you know, earthquakes and and things like that and so um, yeah some of these areas with steep slopes with with broken up rocks are prone to to rock slides and things of that nature and so um, even though there's um, there, we can see on the screen right now there's um, some of those bigger chunks of rock have are providing a nice foothold with some topography for those uh, organisms to filter feed on but uh, yeah, we're not seeing quite the same level of kind of extensive development, probably because that every once in a while that that slide happens and uh, that disturbance sort of wipes out some of the organisms living there. But uh, yeah, that's my yeah, intuition. I, but yeah, it seems that way. It seems like um, when, what the Pisces group uh, dives from Hurl were saying is that there was evidence of slope failures on their dives, and it kind of seems like everything that you said kind of tracks with that. Yeah, and you can see sort of the sorting on the screen. You have sort of the, like right here in the middle, there's sort of the bigger rocks, and then it's fading out into smaller and smaller rocks, and then eventually more of a sand. And so there's kind of waves of, of these slides kind of coming down. And that's, uh, yeah, pretty typical of uh, some of these slide events. So that certainly seems like what we're looking at in this area, at least. Yeah. And, yeah, kind of going back to the, kind of the biological tilt of this mission that, you know, you, you can think about sort of larvae and, and things going kind of everywhere. Uh, there are some biological cues that tell things that this is a good place to settle versus not. But um, certainly over time, those, those big sills that we saw yesterday, those have been sort of providing safe haven and, and great places for 
uh, corals and, and crinites to, to feed and grow. So that seems to be really where a lot of the, the biology has been. Um, oh. Wow, is that a, an urchin there? Oh, Looks like wow. a big yeah. yeah. Very big spines, no? And then these crinoids are they're they're interesting. Their their fans are all their arms are all up, straight up. Yeah. That's an interesting behavior. Wonder what what the current's doing then to tell them to do that. It's only those those yellow ones. Yeah, uh -huh. that's what I was noticing too. It's this specific type of crinoids are doing that behavior. I don't uh. think we, we saw those so much yesterday. Here we go. So Norbit has not led us astray. It looks like we're, as we All approach right. this ridge here, we're getting some um, some kind of rockier, oh, harder substrate. Great. So this is more oh, of what yeah. we were seeing yesterday. Oh, that looks cool. Very cool. So yeah, this could be a good place for us to sort of mow the lawn with our, our stereo cameras. Um, hey, Jonathan, can you turn the cameras on? Are they on? Record. Uh, yep. Stand by. I have a viewer who's asking if the ROVs actually have the ability to record a sound, or is the pressure too great for sound recording equipment? So, not necessarily, because we can deploy hydrophones at uh, at various depths. However, the ROV itself is inherently noisy. Um, we're running uh, hydraulics at. 3,000 psi, so we have a an electric motor feeding the hydraulic pump. So we are inherently noisy. So any noise that background from the ocean itself and from the uh, fauna and uh, other creatures would be drowned out by ourselves. So yeah, yeah, we've uh, deployed hydrophones before, and we've had to de deploy them and drive away for them to be useful at all for yeah. Ocean Networks Canada, and then gone back and retrieved them. Um, and it was interesting to see the, the ROV signature as it uh, left and then came back. And this is really kind of a striking feature here, it's volcanic. Yeah. Jonathan, just confirming, uh, Triclops is on. Confirm. So Confirm. Okay, on our, um, Nor our Norbit map here, it looks like that's that heavily shadowed area. So that high resolution mapping did kind of pay off on our way down. I don't know that we, we would have jaunted over t this way if it wasn't for that. I have a question. Um, is this in the Hawaii current or another current in the Pacific? Does anyone know the currents that go around Hawaii? Maybe navigation? I'm not, I'm not up on my named currents. Yeah. <laughs> Regionally named currents. I know we're in the Pacific Gyre, which is also called the Turtle Gyre. We have a viewer comparing uh, the view right now that we're seeing to the Southwest Desert Mountains and says it looks very similar to that with your occasional flower here or there. I can definitely see that. Yeah. Uh, so back row there, were you setting up those cameras, or what's the status on that there? Sorry, setting up cameras? Uh, yeah, sorry, I thought I heard something about doing some, some photogrammetry or something here, or just scanning around. Oh, um, yeah, so I'm currently doing the photogrammetry, okay. and uh, depending on the interest of Travis and Ignacio, um, I think that we would have the choice to either uh, kind of continue this left-right uh, scanning um, that we're currently on. We can also go up and down the surface of this cliff. Uh, it's up It's up to you, Travis. Yeah, I think it would be great if we could do a little bit more of this kind of left to right scanning so we can sort of mow the lawn of this cliff feature. Roger. And then um, sort of kind of mow ourselves upward, if that makes sense. Okay. And I am having, uh, uh, Rachel Rachel went down to the data lab and we've put both fisheye cameras also so the pilots can have awareness of that. Awesome. Um, Simon, it's up to you, um, but we can, I believe, have the option to display that on the upper right hand 
of the the quad full screen as well if that if that helps your visualization sure. of yeah. the camera shots yeah do we want to start lower down on this feature that would be great if we could start like towards closer to the bottom yeah yeah so that way we could sort of ride it up yeah it's really like this whole wall and it's interesting there when you see that the textural change of those kind of um, blocky um, blocky columnar kind of features and then you've got this more it's like more of a flow and then an ex a large extrusion coming out of the yeah. flow so this is one of the flanks of the, this is that northern arm of this ridge so it's interesting to see how that kind of formed great yeah and so for our viewers back home this is that 3d photogrammetry that we're working on right now and so the idea is that we'll kind of go from side to side with creating overlapping images with this uh, three camera array. And by going side to side up the cliff, we can sort of fully image and reconstruct this in our computers. So there's only so much that we can do in terms of interpretation and understanding when we're out here looking at the screen. Uh, but when we take this uh, back home in the lab with us, that'll give us a lot more time to look at some of these patterns. So for example, here we can see, you know, those differences in the rock faces. Uh, does that influence uh, the types of organisms, you know, that choose to settle? Like, are they interested in um, sort of that smooth texture versus the rough texture, those differences in slope? Uh, so these are things that we can pull apart in a more quantitative way uh, to try to understand better the what makes things live uh, where they do uh, here on the seamount. Travis, why should people at home care where the animals decide to live on the deep sea what do, what does this help tell us yeah i think you know there's so many uh, different ways that we could we could approach that question i think from sort of a a very basic level uh, the deep sea is is certainly something that's connected to us through the oceans and so uh, we can think about uh, some of these organisms especially um, the more sensitive ones, these can be kind of like canaries in the coal mine. And so uh, by uh, looking at perhaps changes in, in some of these corals, if we see declines in their populations, this could be really useful indicative um, indicators of uh, other things that might be going on um, in, the, in the deep sea that could be, you know, trickle up the, the food chain into things like fisheries and, and fish and things that we care about. Uh, for feeding our bellies. And so, you know, I think that's that sort of interconnectedness is, is certainly one aspect uh, of all of this. And especially as we're going through this period of rapid environmental change, uh, having these uh, repeated surveys through time and understanding how things are um, sort of changing their preferences can, can help us better understand how the planet's changing and, and in turn how that might be impacting us too. Thank you, Travis. Great answer. I was trying to get my students to look at the interconnection uh, between things. They always want to know why. Why should we care? Yeah, and I think, you know, highlighting that, you know, we always want to know why, and that's why we're here. There's so much that we don't know, uh, especially about the deep sea, and in part because it's been so hard to access it. We've had, um, you know, pretty limited capacity for spending extensive amounts of time down here, and that's where this technology is really incredible. Uh, these ROVs allow us to spend a lot more time underwater uh, looking at everything that's going on. And then on top of that, this, this newer technology, uh, Renato was highlighting how Norbit sort of detected this bigger feature as something we might want to highlight from our previous dives. We, we knew from this area that these big rock faces could be places where we'd see lots of corals and crinoids. And so uh, Norbit helped us detect this as a, a place for us to really focus on. And, uh, was able uh, for us to find this interesting cliff and um, and then we can fully image it and bring it home uh, to look at those kind of patterns and processes. Um, so yeah, pretty exciting mix of, of geology and biology and uh, you know I think a lot of times we we often focus on what we see in the screen but uh, I really like this watch because there's been so much of the focus on the engineering that's made this possible too. Yeah. Uh, from 
you know, piping these images direct into that data lab for us to uh, start processing some of this stuff and as close to real time as possible. Well, Jason says he would love a time lapse showing the white crinoids crawling up this rock. And I have to agree, I think that would be pretty cool. That, that would be awesome. We would, uh, we would need to park this ROV for a while for yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, crinoids are not exactly known for their fast moving capabilities. <laughs> they do, when, once they uh, jump off and they kind of like, all their arms are going, it's, it's kind of beautiful to watch. I've never seen a crinoid swimming, and oh, I wow. would you're love to see that. Yeah, I've really seen should. diving a lot of times. I might have tried to poke one to try and see if I could get him to go swim, but no, they hold on tight. <laughs> Yeah, you should see. Uh, I've seen it videos of in Nautilus highlights. Yeah, yeah, that's the only way I've seen it, but not in person. Yeah. But you're right, for all that effort, they don't really go very far. <laughs> <laughs> and we have um, a viewer saying that thank you for showing the lovely coastline of Ocean View, Hawaii, and that they've been watching us, but not in a stalking way. <laughs> <laughs> Another viewer is saying that they saw for the first time Nautilus explored the Musician Sea Mound and the life you could see with these cameras, and they'd love to see them explore with these new cameras. Um, like to compare what it looked like back then to now what it looks like with this new technology. And so, yeah, that's kind of what we're doing in this yeah. area, right? We're going back and we're re-looking at these areas that were high interest. So who knows, in future expeditions, we might be able to go back and visit yeah. other highlight areas. Yeah, because 2011 was the last time they were back here. Yeah. So now we're just going back with, in, you know, one that gives us, take a look at what was there and between the camera technology there and what it is now with the high def and the cinematography. The other thing we get to do is see what has changed in 10 yeah. years, 11 years. When, you know, landslides, there's been volcanic eruptions since then. Yes, there's been many there's earthquakes. Been so very active area here. So high, high amounts of change we may find as they go back and take a look. Uh, Renato, do, do we know how, how big this wall is? I'm just thinking of, about when we should uh, start heading back uh, towards the left on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, without without some uh, ship ship moves, I think that um, I think that that's probably the extent that we'll get, and uh, to the right, yep. um, and then so we can start to now that it's curving around. I'll talk with Dan here, and I think we can um, we can start to do our next pass to the left. Um, I'll wait for Dan to get online. Excellent, that sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Dan, we just did our base. Uh, the base of the of the wall, and that would be like the next pass up, uh, going going south um, along this uh, wall. I'm going to give you a quick TVL reset. Right. There we go. Yeah, and so a, a little bit more about how this technology works. Um, Basically, we're taking advantage of overlapping images. So the software is finding things, the same point that appears in multiple images, and using that to, to line them all up together. And when we have lots of images from lots of different angles, um, we can uh, start to see sort of depth and structure from that, because we're through that parallax of seeing things from like this fish, for example, you see that sh shadow drifting across uh, as it moves. It gives us some sense of how far away that fish is from the bottom. And so we're doing kind of the same thing um, here with that structure from motion of uh, stitching all this up, this incredible, again, incredible software uh, engineering that makes this possible uh, so that we can uh, re-image and reconstruct the seafloor. Helps if I'm close to the seafloor, I guess. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, you'll see um, at the base of the wall there's kind of a more smooth rock, and then we were we had kind of imaged that, and now we're getting up into this blocky stuff um, uh, as we as we kind of come around the come around the bend. 
Right. Why do we have the down lights on? No, we don't. Just the iris or the Zeus is looking up. Yeah, yeah. Is that requested to look up in the light like that? No, I think we just um, were following right something here. earlier. Am I meant to uh, walk around it here? Yeah, I think once this curves around, you'll see that kind of wall like bit. We were kind of like just a bit lower than it. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, five meters away from the last pass here, looks like. Yeah, it looks like so. Let's see. Yeah, we're at like, um, we're like nine meters up, I think. I don't so know where I did the last one. Sorry. Where, where uh, you did the last one? Yeah, yeah, it looks like it. Um, we're, it's kind of sheer, so we were a bit lower on this wall. Uh, um, but this is a this is a good pass too, and then we can come back in the, through the middle, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, looks like I walked uh, to the west there a bit. Yeah, on the first pass, I think you're at 0.2 meters. So I saw back here. Yeah, we're doing a little kind of like a, a vertical mowing the lawn, yeah. almost. I need to probably go by the depth because the altitude's going to change depending on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't uh, recall what the, alt uh, the, the the depth was, but it was it's basically this shadowy feature here in the Norbit. Um, oh, so I'm far enough to the south now. Come back the other way. Yeah, Roger that. Okay. Hey guys, this is Devin. I'm stepping in for Daniela. Uh, what were we? Just to grab some dinner. Right uh, video, can we put triclops at the top right? Please. There we go. There's our there's our wall. <laughs> yeah. Is this uh, what you're so an image? I think okay. so. It's kind of like, and you'll see that uh, as you go down, there's like a, you, want me you can to go see down? the base of it in that screen there. And um, I can see the base in the stereo cameras. Yep, yep. Oh, it's coming up there. I'm going to come up too. And um, incredible well, this is actually just kind of like an offshoot of it. It really was this, um, these couple passes right here. Right um, I'll, wait I'll wait till you're... That's a great part about this uh, photogrammetry um, that we're doing is all of this stuff is useful, really. So yeah. spinning around, you know, as Jonathan has been explaining, this you know this stuff can be done rapidly. So all of it's all of it's being collected, all of it can be added to the model. And for the viewers out there, what you're seeing in satellite three is essentially the big main camera, but the two lower are the two stereographic cameras that they're using, and that's collecting all that data that they're going to use. Uh, for in reality capture to get these 3D models to be created. Yeah, it's one of those instances where uh, more is more for both the precision um, and the accuracy of the model. Um, it's, that's kind of why we have a little bit of a mix of uh, pointed down and these two stereo cameras kind of side by side recording a parallel view. Um, even that very slight uh, difference in spacing between the lens means a lot when objects are closer to the frame. Uh, just like this little cluster of of uh, life on those two rocks there is a great example because ROV Hercules is probably okay. about a meter. Yeah, so I think that there's a gap kind of between this. If we just go back to the base of this, uh, where this DVL trap, where it's doubled up, that'll be the base of the wall, and then we can kind of reacquire and kind of crawl up from there. So, Jonathan, you want to tell them why they're fisheye lenses? Yeah, so um, they're fisheyes. The system was designed to do two things well. Um, one of them is this photogrammetry element. So 
Um, with the, the actual name of the, the system is the Wide Field Camera Array. And a wide field camera describes uh, uh, usually, well, an array of cameras that is really meant to capture as much information as possible, in this case, in, in um, limited by the amount of light that ROV Hercules is uh, putting out into the world, that light pool. And that light pool, you can actually see it in the Atalanta view right now on satellite feed two. Um, and the remarkable thing about the light pool is, is how small it is, how truly small it is uh, in relation to the rest of the environment that we're looking in. So these two fisheye cameras, and um, because they have yeah, such a... if you just descend a bit, that'll, that'll get to the that transition. So yeah, we... We're back to where we started. Yeah, if you um, descend a little bit more. So we had kind of just imaged under that little lip there. And so kind of this this whole area here is, is ripe for the for the imaging. You see that transition of the, uh, the smooth to the blocky. Right. So yeah. we did that already? We did that smooth to blocky kind of ish. And then this kind of whole, this whole region in front of you is, I think, a little under, uh, under imaged. All right, I get closer again. Why am yeah. I so far away? I'm still thinking I got to worry about cameras. It's a really interesting feature here, this, uh, how this wall is kind of curved over. And you could see that we're just sitting here driving around and it, you can easily lose a bit in that. That's something that is really helpful about this Norbit. Uh, pass as a first pass is to kind of acquire these images. And sorry to cut you off there, Jonathan. Oh no, no. Yeah. no. It's yeah, important. Where is our Norbit map? That ain't an Norbit map. This is a Norbit map. Yeah, yeah. That's a Norbit map. So he he just did a quick uh, flip over of it. So I'll zoom out a bit. Mm. Um, so we were over here in the flats, and we said, well, there's some blockiness over oh, here. Oh, I see, I see, yeah. I see. So it paid off already. It did, yeah. Fish. Oh, that's it. Fish. Photogram three over. We're done. <laughs> Ruin the whole model. <laughs> 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 You're never going to live that one. Uh, down. So the, we're using fisheye lenses on one half to to really maximize that light pool. And as Dan just said, he said, well, wow, why am I, why am I so far away? I don't have to worry about the cameras. And, and that's actually a really important comment. Um, and it's the other reason we have such a wide field of view is um, we tuck the cameras a little bit further in compared to yesterday's dive, uh, so they are protected by the rest of ROV Hercules. That's why you can actually see um, the upper uh, bumper bar. But by having the cameras be both very wide and uh, protected, it allows Hercules to actually get much closer to the wall. And when you get close like that, um, you get far, far, far more accurate color. Um, out of out of what's actually there because you don't have as much seawater attenuating the light as you normally would. Where to next? Anyway, just kind of zoom so. around like I stole it. And uh, building on that too, yeah. having that consistent color and consistent distance can really help with consistency in the images so that the software is able to stitch them together more easily. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Would you like me to move Atalanta a bit closer? Sure. Okay, I'll come back. Yeah. Um, I'll just go random, 10 meters okay. closer up to that wall, and then I'll, I think that'll give you a bit of Hey, these. I've seen those. I've seen those bridges. Yeah. Yeah. saw these already. Uh, yeah, That's great. It's well, good to see did. things again. Yeah. Get, get more angles. West, please. Let me go somewhere where I haven't thank gone before. Um, um, thank you. And, and the final reason, actually, I, I guess I forget which other reasons I've said, but the... Um, Roger, I'll come back these cameras are, are, are peering through uh, another lens underwater, and it's that dome. Come down there. And Every you'll have to Google, or, or maybe Dan can better explain the physics behind how um, peering through a dome and into the water um, with a little air gap, what's called an air gap, between the lens and the outer dome, like the hardcore physics behind that. But essentially... Um, an advantage of a fisheye is that not only do you have that field curvature, so that the, the very wide angle, but your focal plane Been is also before. very wide, um, and it matches somewhat the the field curvature of the lens of that or the dome that's in front of it. So it allows you to simulate a, a sharper image with a smaller dome. Um, so it's the vast, very complicated. To be to be really frank, I don't really understand the physics behind it. But Dan, do you do you have any uh, uh, a have better one. explanation for that? Uh, uh, I do not. Or, I just know that you know the fisheye lenses really give you a broader perspective. Yeah. And that's really the that's really what you get from this. Well, I'm doing a snatcher, right? 
Do we, do we also have right, the capacity to, to turn on the lasers briefly to get some scaling? Oh, solid. Roger. Uh, you know how to turn on the lasers, right? Hotel lights, lasers. One thing I really like about the way uh, Dan is flying right now is is he's flying very rapidly. Um, yep. In this instance, where we're not needing to slow down for too much biology, um, you really can't move fast enough uh, in terms of, of scanning with uh, the type of cameras that we're using. And we saw the fish go by a little like while ago. Does that interfere with the imaging at all like as you're skulls. trying to process that? <laughs> Um, though moving objects really mess up um, photogrammetry, actually, because... Yeah. Yes, sir. Is that something that you can they're go back and fill in a little bit? Yeah, they're unable to... Um, uh, the really? algorithms that are looking for points to match between different images, um, it, it's, re it's the algorithms for photogrammetry are... are um, Calculating I, I how those two points them. between so two, say, high contrast rock tips, uh, between two images, how much did that really move in relation to the other points? So when and you by have that a moving target that's actually taking place, it's really throwing that off. Yeah, yeah, it just it just yeah. messes everything up. And and the algorithm can push through. For each one of these images, I've been seeing an average of uh, about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 like individual spots where between different images, reference points between the two different images, they're called tie points, um, which is very good for underwater work. Where, this is I don't think we got um, this. For, for underwater work and photogrammetry underwater, it, in particular, it, it's very challenging because There's you're also changing how the familiar. shadows move because you're, you're bringing all of your own light. So that's a problem because uh, your algorithm, uh, photogrammetry relies on a high contrast point to kind of grab onto, so to speak, between different images and say, ah, here's, here's uh, that coral tip over here and I'm going to follow it. Um, across many different images. Well, if you have latched onto what is a shadow, normally that's okay because it's in, on, on Earth, the shadow is the sun. It's created by the sun and it's not changing. But with a light, you can make a shadow disappear by moving a little bit further over. And that control point then, that tie point will disappear. Okay. So that's why photogrammetry underwater, what we're doing is by no means at all um, like revolutionary in terms of uh, the technologies that we're putting forth in terms of the, the algorithms that we're using. That's kind of the point of this project is that we're using existing production ready tools um, and rapidly uh, uh, iterating um, because the real hard part is the fact that we're underwater. Right. Um, and we and not only underwater, we're in the deep sea with an ROV, with limited bandwidth and, and all of the things that go along with working in the deep sea. We had someone write in uh, earlier that saying that with all the use of the technology that we have that we're using now, it's almost like we're filling in the gaps yeah. from the things that we've had and just kind of filling in those gaps that so we'll be able to piece it all together again. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. It looks and this, like that Atalanta move is complete. This technology by, way, so by no closer. means uh, replaces the uh, Zeus and, and the work of the video team, as an example. Right. Um, you can even see it, the quality difference still between a 15-year-old camera in terms of uh, what we can broadcast um, out on satellite feed one versus um, the image that we can get off of the cameras in real time. It's, it's not even close, you know. It's true that when you download all of the footage out of these, you know, uh, wonderful 6K cinema grade, very low light, very wonderful sensor that's able to capture a lot of detail, yeah, it, it'll, it'll, it'll be an incredible high fidelity image. But for our bread and butter work, where we need a very reliable camera that has a 20, how much is a zoom on uh, Zeus, Dave? Uh, 17 by. Yeah, I mean, that, that incredible zoom, the capacity to rapidly focus in and on, uh, on an animal, like this technology is not meant to replace that. Right. It's meant to complement the type of data that we get because um, I mean, look look around us right now. We've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten people sitting in a control room, all contributing to to this research, which is totally typical of uh, what's needed uh, to to conduct a deep sea 
um, ROV operation. Um, so it's our goal to test technologies and the processes that, uh, that might inform how we can maximize that use of time. So in this instance, here's three cameras. Um, um, what does this offer research? What does this offer in terms of our capacity to document um, what we're seeing for uh, different reasons? Because our ROVs go down and they see something. They, they ex we, we explore a spot and, and it's highly unlikely that anyone is ever going to go back to that spot ever again. Right. Uh, for Jonathan, that's probably enough lasers on the screen, yeah? Uh, yes, sir. So maybe we could get the lasers off. For can you uh, kill the lasers, please, Ray? Thank you. Uh, for the viewers, you can see that on Slap Feed 1, there are those green dots 10 centimeters apart. That gives us a, a nice sense of scale for how big everything is. Um, and so that will allow us to scale our the full model that we, we generate from this. And so it's nice to have, a, have that solid reference point. And the really cool part with this is we have you know, that scaling plus the images, and I believe we've already scanned this with Norbit also, right? Yeah. So I'm Flying around a Norbit map as we speak. We have sort of multiple types of technology for, for imaging this, this cliff to hopefully um, really get a better sense of what's going on. Is that a sea star on that coral? Yeah, looks like it's, it's upper right. Out in there. Seen that one ten times already. If I keep doing this, there's going to be no purple left on and black on the map. It's going to be all my green snail trails. <laughs> yeah. I've gone, gone over it. I don't know, a dozen times maybe now. In various arbitrary. I angles. think it looks pretty complete. Yeah. Yep. So we can move on. Yep. Great. Um, Roger that. Yeah, and again, for our viewers, you know, it seems sort of repetitive, but the idea is that we really want to um, cover everything. Those extra cameras give us more overlap yeah, between all the images. For in, but uh, where are we going hey, Zach, next? I'm gonna temper. I'm gonna stop we're recording actually until we're out of the field of view, just to have a really yeah, discreet unit. Got it. What's that? That sounds great. Yep, westward. Yeah. Um, yeah, that'll help us a lot. You okay. Can, uh, I'd say instead of. Uh, at any point, if you want me to start recording for the true tracks that yeah, so marry between two pieces, that's great. Okay. That? But um, about definitely oh, from looking, looking at the data here. yesterday, having some more discrete chunks will oh, increase our, our capacity to, yeah, to actually I marry see. them up. Yeah, Sorry, I think that's way better, especially yep. since we have Norbit to sort of next? overlay the features on, because in between uh, is also so. not very interesting and doesn't tie well. So totally on the same page with you there. Okay. Is this another? Is this separate? Is this a new feature or the same one? Oh, okay. It looks to be the same one where they're flying. Yeah, it looks pretty, pretty similar. Nice snail trail yeah. we've been here. Yeah. All right, I'll bump. Uh, All right, you're being switched out. Yeah, I'll stand I'm out by. here. <laughs> you're good. I'm out. Thank you for that. Yeah, dude. That was excellent. <laughs> I like that. More of that. Yeah, if you listeners heard anything, let's talk about the speed of the RV. Oh, that's feel a very important part for the photogrammetry. Um, a lot go. of people think you the can have, to you know, more images will be better, but what, mm -hmm. what that really results in is a lot more time on the back end. Yeah. There is definitely a, an ideal number you're looking for where you're getting a certain percentage of overlap. Um, and too much, yes, you can get, you know, a better model. But you're going to be there for hours longer, um, and it, it <laughs> doesn't really make that much of a difference. Oftentimes, yeah. So it's, you know, you'll see um, even on the reef when people are doing it themselves. If you're not kicking this, the same speed, your model is going to get really weird in certain areas, and things totally. aren't consistent. And photogrammetry is all about consistency. So yes. being here, we're very lucky to have um, ROV drivers like uh, Dan and Simon who can move that consistent speed for us and and really help um, with with the project that's going on here.
Bridge, bridge, nav, two zero at two nine zero, please. Thank you. So we just completed the, uh, essentially, the data collection on this. So we're moving to the next feature. Yeah, yeah so for Renato, or is there sort of more similar cliff faces up ahead, or what are we looking at in this area from the Norbit? Hey, Travis, I'm actually standing in for Renato oh, right okay. now. I know, it's uh, kind of hard to see that. Yeah. <laughs> <in> <laughs> <here>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Happened to me yesterday as well. Um, if you look over at our nav G screen, which is the lower one all the way to the yep. left, um, you'll see over this way kind of which corresponds to uh, more of the ridge itself rather than the valley that we kind of came down in. It looks like there's a little more topography and some interesting stuff. So we're just going to bump uh, 20 meters to start at 290, which will get us into this kind of black area, which might be some interesting uh, feature there. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a comment in the chat saying, hey, smile. You're not stuck on a straight line wondering how to cut yourself free. This is amazing. So I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty. Uh, that was pretty exciting. This in the mid mid afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was sitting in the lounge eating popcorn. It was like, ooh, excitement. That just uh, shows you the skill <laughs> yes. of everyone True on skill. the ship to work I mean, together yeah, and get out of problems. Like, I feel like with my own two hands, a lot of times I can't switch a knife back and forth, <laughs> let alone with a robot arms. Incredible, yeah, amount of talent on the ship. It's been this has been really fun. You know, yeah. getting to see everyone in very unique uh, skills and talents and perspectives too. And I think that's what's like really amazing about this type of deep sea research is just the amount of different expertise that needs to come together to make this happen. It's really impressive. And, and all the different backgrounds too. Like if whatever your skill set is, you can make it apply to, I feel like. It's not just you need to study biology, you need to study chemistry. You know, there's everyone here is from different wakes and specialty you just have to have a love of the ocean i feel like yeah i agree with that is this a new feature uh um, i think we've been over this uh yes yeah this is in our covered area okay yeah And one of our viewers has said they've seen a sunburst pattern of basalt in Wyoming. Ooh, mm. that sounds fun. Yeah, it'd be kind of cool if we got a sunburst pattern down here, too. Yeah, I don't think we've quite seen that yet. Not yet. We've seen a lot of good, you know, lava features. Yeah. <laughs> there are a lot of lava features, that's for sure. Have you ever played that game where you, like, look into the cloud and you try and see, like, what, what the clouds look like? We can maybe do the basalt version. You <laughs> there know? you go. Well, we already had our pillows. We had our ice cream sandwiches. <laughs> pizza the Great boxes, Wall of Hawaii pizza spaghetti boxes. Spaghetti noodles. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about the noodles. How can oh, I forget the about the noodles? noodles. Yeah. I feel like there's a, a the food ramen. trend coming on. <laughs> <laughs> gonna, yeah. gonna, viewers at home are going to start to think they don't feed us out here. Which is certainly not true. There's a lot of great food here. <laughs> if anything, I've been eating too much. I know. Yeah. Same here. Glad I brought my big pants. <laughs> uh. Right. All right. Maybe so we're now moving into new well, terrain. Exciting. Valleys and cliffs. Keep so your yeah. eyes open, yeah. Travis. Yeah. We have uh, uh, like a viewer saying complete. that if fish eye lens Atlanta's, makes sense for looking uh, at fish, <laughs> I guess with a fish eye lens, you get real it. fish eye view. So we got to oh, keep hello. our fish eyes open. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing too with watching these screens. Sometimes there's really small details that can be easy to miss. Yeah. I like these view though with Hercules shining down on these fisheye views. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a fun thing um, with the configuration that they're in right now, um, we can record uh, true stereoscopic. 
And what so, does that mean? What is true stereoscopic? Uh, true stereoscopic means you're actually using two. What's that out in the distance oh. of Hercules? Something. There's a white oh. something. Oh. Whoa. Oh. Whoa. Oh. 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 That's exciting. What is this? Quick, record. Uh, Record. What is that? Oh, is, is that a belly of a stingray? So is that oh. a yeah. Oh, oh, it is oh. a stingray. Oh. <laughs> Very cool. What kind of stingray what? is that? I don't know. I'm checking my... Uh, not many. Wow. Why am I trying to do photogrammetry on this? My instinct was to turn <laughs> the cameras on really <laughs> quickly. <laughs> yeah, I, I got you. We got the stereo. <laughs> yeah. I got you, Jonathan. We got it. Uh, we got yeah. the stereo, yeah. though. You know what? We could, though. We could do a... Uh, 3D photo. Maybe yeah. we can try to publish that. That'd be cool. Wow. View view a stingray in 3D because photographic oh, guitar. Nose. Wow! Look at him. He's got wow. a pokey nose. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a different. There's two families of stingray. Am I correct? Like there's the one with the oh, I'm gonna try more to flexible this. nose and one with the more fixed nose. I'm blanking right now in this my brain what they are. Wow. It's doing a lot of vertical swimming, which is yeah. quite surprising. I don't know if it's it's the lights or if it's. Uh, Wow. Wow. Really interesting. All right. Well, we might as well record some video. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. All right. We're recording video. <laughs> so. All right. We're it, now. It looks like a female. Right? It doesn't. Wow. Oh, my wow. gosh. Incredible. Look at that. Ooh, Look at that. Wow. Uh, I'm kind of blown out of my camera. We will start looking for ID in a minute. We're going to take a minute to enjoy this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. This is very typical Nautilus where we're doing something. <laughs> <laughs> we see something pretty yeah. and we're like, oh. Follow it the just pretty. looked like a floating orb at first. Too. Yeah. Yeah. I thought it was much smaller too. Yeah. Was it a water column? I thought it was just... Well, that's, yeah. that's the other fun thing um, about having these fisheye cameras on is uh, yesterday, just because there's such a wide field of view, they're illuminating every inch of the amount of light in front of the of Hercules. Uh, we, we keep spotting these things that otherwise we wouldn't have necessarily seen. Like yesterday we had uh, a gulper eel that kind of appeared in the lower right-hand corner of one of the fish eyes that enabled us to kind of actually be more situationally aware of what's what's around us. Yeah, I want to um, say this is some type of shovel nose ray, um, but I do not know them off the top of my head. So see if anyone in the chat at yeah. home can help us with the idea of this type that, of. That's surgery. pretty remarkable. That's where very we active. Wow. Seems wow. to be running into things. Yeah. It's going backwards. We're probably blinding it with our lights, maybe. Wow. Oh, uh, amazing. Very neat. <sighs> So someone in the chat asked if this is a skate or a ray. And I don't think we have any skates in Hawaii. So the yeah, I think I agree with you. I don't think uh, I don't know any either. But it does seem to have a fleshier Sorry, yeah. Okay. Fleshier tail instead of so Oh, I, is it eating or did it just bump into the wall there? Maybe oh, just kind of There you go. Let them go out of frame. Yeah. So stingrays and skates are both cartilaginous fish. They're kind of related to your sharks. Very cool. See you, dude. They're like a flat or, uh, shark. Oh, they're coming back. Is he coming back? <laughs> He's waving. Yeah. Bye. Travis, do you want to talk a little bit more about the difference between skates and rays? It could be a skate. Oh. Not sure I'm the best person to speak on that one. Travis, before we get into that, um, science team, is this a, this is a new feature? This kind of little cliff face. Is this something that we want to look at further, or keep moving? Uh, Great question. We are focusing on the stingray. I didn't see as much on the rocks as last time. Did you all as we were driving yeah, by? Yeah, I, I didn't see a whole lot down there. I think we should be moving on. Yeah, I think so, too. Roger that. We definitely have a geologist in the chat. While we were looking at the stingray, they're like, and yet is that ridge basalt. Mm. TJ, is your auto heading something you want to or need a sec to troubleshoot? Or we're good to go. Great. 
One might say we've been basalted Ooh. on these dives. <laughs> <laughs> so I know one of the differences between skates and rays is just the general shape of them. Um, okay. And then also oh, the, the spines on the back. Like so if we, back. if it comes back and get closer, the, the spines on the back is a good telling way. The shape sometimes, um, it's not always the easiest. Bridge, bridge I feel like they can have quite the uh, differing within the, within the group. So, yeah, I don't know. But is that one didn't have a super long tail. It didn't, which typically and I thought that's usually like, right? Uh, rays have the, what we know of as the long spiny tail. Yeah. It's more, and um, it has the spikes on it. Whereas a ray has a fleshier tail. It's not a spike, but yeah. it has thorns at the end of the tail. Yeah, and I, I don't know. I don't yeah. know what that one was. We'll keep looking. I have to say I'm more familiar with my Alaska skates. <laughs> um, and then my surface, like in Hawaii, we get a lot of manta rays. We get a lot of eagle rays. Um, but I don't know about Hawaii deep sea rays and skates. Mm -hmm. The Depth 23 cruise, we caught the first um, North Pacific white skate actually in the process of laying an egg. Oh, wow. wow. That's, uh, that is on Twitter if you look up Nep Depth 23. Uh, there's footage of that. So one of our viewers put in um, the scientific name and into the chat saying it is a hexa trigonide hexa trigon and I, I googled it and it says that the common name for that is six gill stingray neat it looks yeah, pretty it cool. looks like it so when I look so it up we got the six gill shark and the Traverse six gill yeah stingray. we wow. got six gill stingray six gill shark Taylor Ann, is that is that having the six gills? Does that help with adaptation of uh, being allowed to absorb more oxygen since you have an extra gill? Because I know that normal ad or most gills for uh, skates and sharks are five. So is that an extra adaptation, or is it leftover evolutionary that animals have now evolved to only have five from six? It's a great question. I do not know the answer to that, but I can look into it for you. Yeah, um, but I yeah. Um, if anyone in definitely the is a benefit knows. to have an extra gill. I think gill. so. That's yeah. what I've always, my hypothesis has been. Because yeah. our six gill sharks are also always very deep as well. Yeah. I think um, that the the ray that we, did it look like this one, Dan, here? Or did it look different? I didn't quite catch the tail. No, I think it did yeah. look like that. Like it the tail was. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. this is the right depth. So it might be a hexa trigon piccoli. I, 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 bu I butchered the. I butchered the scientific I name, too. Common name is Six Gill Stingray. <laughs> I'll stick with that one, I guess. Awesome. Yeah, that was a, a great Hexa -trigon shot to come Bicelli. walking on. It is a very, especially when you say it like that, I feel like that's the start of a it is. Well, look at them. kind of thing. It looks like it belongs in Star Trek, <laughs> along with the space whales. It even has the shape of the Star Trek Absolutely. Symbol. I would say the fish eye lenses up there really do help. Yeah. It does, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Both of them. We, we saw first. it first yeah. in the fish eye. There we go. You heard it. <laughs> Jonathan feels validated now. <laughs> yeah, totally. You have no idea. <laughs> Gulper eel. Yeah. Six, is that a first sighting for Nautilus, the six gills stingray? I... Oh, what I've learned about Nautilus is that there's always someone <laughs> that has been on some ex expedition that can usually actually say, oh my gosh, I remember when we were here and we saw that. Yeah, our, some of our um, more Long dedicated time. viewers will Dave, probably fill us in if we've ever seen a We have, And we have Dave, Dave up there. He's, he's, he's a, a Nautilus um, staple. Uh, Dave, have, we, have you ever seen one of those guys yet? Dave is at dinner. Oh, whoops. <laughs> Dave, you changed. Banal. You've been on Nautilus for two weeks. Have we seen? <laughs> <laughs> 
You know, it's funny though. Uh, like sometimes, if it, if you're not on the same watch, it, it could be true. Like Manal's like, oh, now we saw we saw that last night. <laughs> yeah, I've never. That's a first for me. Pretty cool. Hmm. But you should definitely ask Dave when he gets back. I'm sure. Oh. I'm sure he's seen something. Dave and uh, Rennie. Between the two of them. So we have a question in the chat. Are unidentified species a common occurrence on Hercules excursions? Well, I think yes. it's really hard to do unidentified species. You yeah. know, so. We have a lot of eyes. Um, there's also not so much, I guess, on this team or this expedition. But um, Taylor Ann, can you talk about how the communication for the science community works for Nautilus? Sorry, I think I, I missed the context oh. of the question. <laughs> Sorry. So um, they're asking if there's a lot of unidentified species. And I think we, we have a really good science communication network here. It's not just us here in the control van, but also scientists. So I was yeah. wondering if you could kind of fill our viewers in and how that network works. Yeah, so we're operating on more science-focused cruises, uh, doing collections, and you know, getting a, a, a feel for what communities look like and describing those communities. Um, we know that experts are all over the world and not just aboard Nautilus. Um, so we have a science ashore chat where they can chime in and sign up. Um, and yeah, often they will chime in and be like, yep, we know exactly what this species is and, or no, we don't. This is something new. We haven't seen this before. So it really helps to have the context of experts from all over to be able to tune in at any time. Um, yeah, because I only know so much. <laughs> um, Which is also but, still a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's helpful to have uh, like fish, fish experts um, or coral experts tune in and help us identify things. Um, I know last expedition we saw, um, I think they were describing it as like a sea avocado, but that's not actually what it is. It was um, some type of an organism that we just don't know what it is. It's in the ID guide here as just unknown animalia. Um, so yeah, we just Very sometimes cool. come yeah. across things that we so have we no idea what they no idea what they are, and um, still need to figure that out. So we got some good imagery and footage of that. In the chat, we have um, an acronym they've said we could use: USE, Unknown Swimming Entity. Mm. Mm. There we go. I like that. And then also we have a hello from Canada, who's enjoying the Hawaii weather via us. <laughs> It has been very nice weather. Today's a little bit more windy than previous days, but it's still nice out. Nautilus has been riding very well. So we're just searching, searching for more features or yeah. coral or anything that's any other animal out there. It's the spirit of exploration. There's not too many un, um, unexplored frontiers anymore left in the world, I feel like. It's getting smaller and smaller, so. Yeah, the ocean's a pretty big one. And the, the ocean, I feel big. like the ocean's the last kind of yeah. unexplored frontier, you know? It's amazing. We know more about outer space than we, we do about do. our own oceans. I feel like we've done a better job of mapping the moon than we have our own oceans. Just made Larry very happy. That's a good, <laughs> It's actually a true fact. I may learn it from Larry. Yeah. It's good. I mean, it's just such a remarkable statistic. It's it's it's. So here's a, in the comments saying that they usually find at least a dozen new species each year. Sometimes they don't even realize it until they sequence the DNA. And I think that's a big thing too. It's like um, the process of establishing a new species and I and setting up a name and saying like, hey, this is a new species is pretty long. It's not like 
you just see it and you're like, oh, that's a new species. Um, it has to be verified. It has to go through multiple eyes, lots of different scientists analyzing, looking at, all to make that conclusive of, is this a new species or is this just a different variant? Someone in the chat asks, is it easier to explore Mars than the deep sea? Oh, that's tough, because they're just different problems. Yeah. It's really hard to get to Mars. Yeah. It's a, and especially with man and that kind of stuff, but, you know. It's hard it, to get to the deep sea, too. The pressures down yeah. here are, are very large. I you think don't find that, you know, in outer space. I think that answer depends on who you ask. If you're asking an ocean explorer or an astronaut. Oh, that's fair. Yeah. And also what you're looking for. What are you trying to explore? Yeah. Right? So, and at what scale? Sort of like earlier we were talking about, you have those ship-based sonar that gives you, in this case, we we're looking at, you know, 50 meter, 100 meter grid resolution. And now we're trying to get down to centimeters. So, yeah, if you're looking at Mars, what are you trying to learn from it? I always for how fast our technology grows. I always like that, you know, we went from our first flight, the Wright brothers, being able to do the first flight to landing on the moon in less than 100 years. So I always think that's a really kind of good way of showing how fast technology, once it starts, it just takes Blossoms. off. Jellyfish? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, little jellyfish. That was so spooky. A UFO jellyfish looking <laughs> thing. <laughs> what did they call it? Unidentified oh, yeah. swimming uh, object? Uh, yep, USC. It's a USC. <laughs> <laughs> comment in the chat saying most of the oldest members remember when Dr. Ballard started and that it's gotten a lot better with the technology and the visualization and he's really been a forefront I think kind of like a leader in our deep sea exploration well a big part of this uh, this particular expedition with uh, ONR has been about um, examining process examining kind of how to do something rather than necessarily entirely focusing on the technology. Um, and that's something that, that I think, if you look back at, at Dr. Ballard's career, um, he's used many technologies, but yeah. but what, what he was a pioneer in and an innovator was the process of finding things. Um, and he applied that process with different tools, whatever, whatever tools were available at the time. Um, the process of, of searching um, in, in the, the systematic way of not getting distracted by a shiny object here, but instead focusing on the goal. Um, the practice of um, communicating excitement about exploration to the world, like um, that's what I'm struck back when I, when I look at Dr. Ballard's career um, and where we're at right now, um, you know, Bob's, Bob's, in, Bob's in the lounge right now probably watching this. Um, this is the result of, of years worth of dedication, effort, teamwork among the oceanographic community, um, partnerships with, with the Navy, partnerships with private industry, partnerships with universities to develop the technologies, et cetera, the, the, the ships that we're on, the, the monitors we're looking at, but, it, but it's, it's united by process. So when the chat asked, um, would the hexagonal, hexagonal rock formations be calmer basalt? And that they took a geology class one time and then asked why it was sideways instead of vertical. And yes, it is columnar basalt. And I'm, I'm not a geologist, but I think the reason it's sideways is just because of the lava formation and it, yeah. Yeah, and I think it depends on flow. which side cools first, right? Yeah. Because yeah. as it cools, it essentially shrinks, and that's essentially what pulls essentially pulls apart from each other. And those pentagonal or hexagonal 
type things, just like mud dries, right? Yeah. Um, in the desert, you see mud the puddle. You see that same then, hexagonal pattern, yeah, yes. for the mud drive. So, you know, that's just the cooling process, where it starts to do it, and then the crack persists down. So if that side cooled first, then that's probably <laughs> where it started, and then it goes that way. I'm not the expert, but that's what I've learned. Yeah. Sounds good to me. So I think what we're doing now is moving up slope and looking for some more features. Yeah, that's exactly right. We're going to head a little uh, southwest in general, and maybe this kind of cliffy looking feature will give us something interesting. Yeah, it appears that the corals really like the cliffs and the hard substrate yeah. because, uh, you know, it gives them something to hold on to and the cliffs provide, you know, flow for them to get food. We and have, we have a couple more. Dave's back in video. Hey, Dave. Welcome back. How was dinner? Lovely. What'd you go for? I had fish, I had chicken, I had salad. Not much of a red meat eater, or just didn't feel like it today? Uh, I, don't, I don't eat the red meat on the ship usually, because um, I never tell exactly what it is. I, I have an aversion to lamb, and one time I grabbed uh, something that looked like beef, and it wasn't, it was lamb, and I, it was not a good experience. <laughs> so. One of the things I think is really fun with, with looking at this, so we're, when we're searching for these deep sea corals, we're searching for this exciting life out uh, in the middle of the ocean, we're going towards these seamounts. So we're finding places where uh, the currents come up and there's sort of upwelling up this uh, these mountainside and that can generate some productivity and stir up some food. So it's a place where uh, organisms, especially filter feeders, like some of these corals we're looking for, uh, like to live. And then if we kind of zoom in a little bit more on this seamount, there's uh, sort of these patches of, of sand interspersed with, with rocks on top of them. So it's, there's sort of acting like a smaller scale version of that, of that sort of rocky habitat that creates space for uh, corals and organisms to live on. And, and then if you step down even a little bit smaller, there's like little rocks and features within that. And so um, that's where you know, biology is sort of organizing itself with these different spatial scales. And we're also using this um, survey equipment at different spatial scales to identify these different types of features. Um, and so we're sort of advancing the tech to, um, yeah, find where things are. And that's why we keep kind of jumping between um, what looks to be like bigger rock features for that uh, basalt to have lots of habitat for for fun biology for us to look at. So Travis, you mentioned um, upwelling. Can you please explain to our viewers what is upwelling and why is it so important? Sure, yeah, so uh, the oceans are what we call stratified and so sort of like when you have uh, your salad dressing in the, in the fridge, uh, that oil separates from the vinegar uh, the same thing's happening in our oceans with different density layers of, of water. And what tends to happen is at the surface waters, we have lots of phytoplankton. Uh, they're taking up all the nutrients. They're taking advantage of that sunlight um, to uh, build organic matter. looking a little better, maybe. Yeah, so they're building life. Looks like we're getting into more interesting features. Um, and yeah, so they're, they're growing, but the, they run out of nutrients. And so um, the way to get nutrients is to sort of recycle things back up. So essentially all of that uh, biology is sinking particles. That's that marine snow we're looking at. And if um, it were to sink all the way, it would just end up at the bottom. But we also have upwelling. So upwelling is when we have uh, winds sort of blowing away us the surface layer and um, if we're sort of blowing away that surface layer, it gets replaced by water that comes up uh, from underneath. So it rises up to the top to fill that gap. 
And when that happens, we're bringing with it uh, those nutrients, those particles uh, to stimulate growth. And so, you know, that can happen at these kind of, again, multiple different spatial scales, whether it's sort of currents hitting the, the rock mountain and kind of bringing those particles and nutrients up, uh, or equatorward winds um, uh, along the coast of uh, California, for example, uh, that pushes away that surface layer. So upwelling is a really big part of our sort of biological pump and regulating our, our climate and, and also for huge for stimulating fisheries for a lot of the fish that we eat also. Thank you for that, Travis. And speaking of like food for fish, I have um, someone in the chat has asked a question about meal prep and was wondering how meal prep works on board the Nautilus. So I know we have part of our crew um, is the galley crew. Uh, do we have two people that work in the galley? Dave, do you know the answer for that? Yes. Yes. Uh, we have two chefs, Jose and Alexander. Uh, and then uh, the galley help is, uh, uh, is George, and he does uh, some help. He's a sous chef, uh, does some help in the kitchen, cleans up, uh, washes, that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, generally it's the, the two chefs, and they, sp they split up the day uh, so that one is working in the morning and doing breakfast, and they collaborate on uh, lunch and dinner. Generally is the way they split that up. And they do a phenomenal job. Yes, they, they keep do. us all very well fed and happy out here. Yep. Oh, and Dave, they asked, um, I was told not to forget to ask you if you know if Nautilus has ever seen a six gill stingray before. Uh, I haven't, uh, and I, I don't know about Nautilus. I haven't heard of one. Um, you'd have to you have to ask somebody that's been around longer than me, <laughs> like Rennie. Rennie's the keeper of institutional knowledge. Um, <laughs> but I haven't, uh, I haven't heard of it. Uh, you'd have to go back and investigate the, Probably not that way. the uh, highlights, the clips. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll set it out to you guys viewing. You guys will we'll put you on the scour through our Nautilus website through the gallery and see if you can find a six-skill stingray in there for us. Um, and then there's another question here of, is there a special type of clearance required for Nautilus to travel around these waters? So what's the, anyone know the clearance that Nautilus needs? Uh, I think that I'm assuming they're asking about like permits to do research and the various types of activities. Oh. Well, that would make sense. I was thinking clearance under the ship, <laughs> like your water depth kind of thing. Um, yes, there is a lot of process of getting permits, especially depending on the type of waters. Like I know when we went in Papa Nam Moko Kea, since it was a protected national um, monument, there was a lot, a lot of paperwork, a lot of permits. We had to have a cultural liaison on board. So depending on the waters, the areas we are, there's definitely a lot of clearance and permits that um, the expedition team or the home operation team works on getting for us. And then someone else says the cooling joints from perpendicular to cooling of the lava flow. So if the flow is on the horizontal surface, then the joints are vertical. But if intrusion is narrow and diagonal, the cooling joints, the create columnar features and perpendicular to the edge of the dike. So there's the answer for why are the basalt we saw was um, horizontal instead of vertical earlier. Thank you, um, watcher, for that information for us. I did not know that. And then we also have a question. Is there hardware on board to allow viewing this real-time video in stereo, such as VR headsets, 3D TV, loom pad? I don't think we have any 3D TV. Is there a VR no. headset? I felt like Jonathan mentioned that. I think we're going to try it out. Yep. Yeah, we got a couple down in the data lab yeah. um, with the goal of yeah. testing it out with these this mapping and, and the models we're building. So. so in the data lab, you guys haven't sneak peeked in 
attuned to well, the VR headsets at all yet? One of the one of the difficulties is that the ship is moving. <laughs> yeah. So when we put on our virtual headset, the doesn't that then just make it 4D? You know, you have. <laughs> it certainly feels like 4D. <laughs> you get the, the smell <laughs> of the ocean and the yeah. movement. Yeah. The the put venues the are flying <laughs> everywhere, yeah. and you can't click we'll on. We'll put things. you on the bow, and you can have the water yeah. spraying you in the face too. <laughs> Uh, it's one of those, if, if you're already sensitive to anything with the movement, you put that on a boat and things <laughs> yeah. start feeling really funny real quick. Uh, um, it's a great way to get nauseous on a boat, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> uh, but, but yeah, I think we'll have time at the end of the trip. Um, as long as we get these models built, um, that is a goal to, to test that out. So don't worry, we will not keep it the Data Lab exclusive. Okay. <laughs> Everybody will get that call. Uh, but yeah, those should be uploaded, I believe, is the plan, so that folks could kind of download them and explore yeah. them themselves. Um, yeah, so, so you guys at home can be able to, if you have VR headsets, download it and take an underwater dive in your living room. Yeah. And then maybe we'll have to upload some TikToks laughing at people putting the VR heads on. <laughs> the VR headset on the boat is, yeah, is rough. <laughs> so it, it just didn't work. <laughs> Not for us, at least. I'll, I'll volunteer to be the first guinea pig. Um, My students are used to laughing at me. So I'm used to it. We've all had a kick out of it. Everyone's like, well, let me try it. Yeah. There's just no way. <laughs> <laughs> but when you know your your mind is expecting certain motions yeah. when the thing goes, and then when the ship's rocking and this is going opposite, <laughs> your body's like, "What is going on?" Yeah, and it, you just so feel sick. what we're saying is we need to have a puke bucket close by. <laughs> yes, <too. laughs> absolutely. And lots of railings to hold on to. <laughs> you yeah. basically have to sit down to use it right now, and yeah. that limits you quite a bit. <laughs> um, we have a question: If we'll be exploring the Kamea Huka Huka Kanaloa. Kamea Huka Kanaloa. Sorry about my pronunciation. I've been working on it. I know I live in Oahu, but I'm still pretty bad at my... I get tongue-tied very easily. Um, formerly, the Loihi Seamount during this expedition. I think that's the plan. I think it's the plan. Yeah. I think that is the plan. Um, always up to yeah. changes and you never, nothing is ever guaranteed, but it is tentatively the plan at the moment to be yeah. able to go and explore that. And that's one of the things I'm really excited for. So yes, yeah, stay tuned for future, future days on that. Um, and then we have another question of, has the Nautilus ever encountered any fossils on excursions? We've come across some whale, old whale bones. Um, it's, uh, but a lot of things don't really fossilize too much on the surface here, I think, because it's all part of that carbon pump. Every, there's bacteria, tube worms, all these biological want that carbon, those minerals in that. So it has to be buried for it to be fossilized. And so since we're not excavating, I think it, so anyone, Dave, have we ever come across fossils? What you consider a fossil? Um, uh, teeth and buried in rocks. Um, the uh, beaked whale uh, skull pieces that we've had sort of like fossils, not complete fossils, but are in the process of fossilizing, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, once again, not my area of expertise. <laughs> I thought you knew all. I don't know. Ask me <laughs> video questions, I can, I can answer those. Zach, here's one I'll throw to you. Does any type of fish live here? Does any type of fish live here? Yeah, so um, what? Yeah. what is, what kind of, I think I'll rephrase their question for them. Um, what kind of fish live here? Mm. Well, honestly, uh, I have not had much time in the deep ocean. There's um, one but, now. But generally, yeah, <laughs> we, <laughs> we do see a lot. Um, if you were watching earlier um, this morning, we ran into quite a large school um, and I'm blanking it right now let's see what was that species it that was, was the rat tail the grenadiers I yeah believe. the grenadiers yeah so I, I'd say that's most common um, in front of us we got another looks like uh, monkfish or goosefish whatever fish the debate was <laughs> um, I think it goes beat. by both names a lot of fish <laughs> have multiple names and that's why we yeah. use scientific names right. so that you don't 
you don't get the confusion of it. But we've yeah. been seeing one of these pretty regularly every dive now. Yeah. Huh? But but I think you see a lot of fish that have become very um, effective at using their energy. Um, so something like this that you know they can wait for something to swim by and can lunge at it quick, um, or just small ones that, that don't have a large body to power. Um, you're not seeing a lot of the like algae grazers, obviously not a whole lot of algae, but also those guys are eating all day long. Um, and to be swimming constantly down here as active as they are, I don't think that's um, necessarily like a, a benefit for them in this depth. So, so yeah, you see a lot of slow moving, very low use of energy um, shapes and sizes. So, so I think it's, it's uh, probably less diverse um, in terms of like the number of species you'd see here compared to like on a coral reef or whatnot, um, just because there are, there are still niches, um, but, but I don't think the speciation actually occurs probably as quick. Um, but I don't know that for a fact. If anybody knows more, please please correct me. Um, but that's that's kind of what my general biology mind would, would think and say. Travis, do you have anything to add to that about sp fish of the deep sea? Yeah, I mean, fish in the deep sea is certainly pretty far out of my wheelhouse. <laughs> so. I know the snail fish is the deepest living fish. So those mm. are the ones you get down to 8,000. 8,600 or so um, meters. So those yeah. are like known to be the deepest ones. And I think as you go even deeper, you lose species of fish. So one viewer is asking about what is the cloudy material we're driving through right now. I think if you're thinking about the little, talking about the little flakes on the screen, that is marine snow, which is kind of your detritus, your dead plant, animal material um, floating down from the surface. And it also is probably a mix of some zooplankton in there as well. And then, has the Nautilus gone to Arctic or Antarctica excursions? I don't think so. We started off in the Mediterranean, moved across, now in the Pacific. But as far as my knowledge, Dan, do you know anything different? I don't. I don't remember it going there. But yeah. you know, I'm not. I'm not the expert. I don't think the bow is made for yeah. dealing with ice. Yeah. So there's um. The uh, having the ice rating is a uh, so uh, if a ship is classified, but there's classification agencies like uh, there's one the Norwegian one's called DNV, and there's actually there's there's this long it look I mean it basically it kind of looks like gibberish, but uh, it's all these like cryptic acronyms. But they'll say oh like this ship is uh, is rated for you know either no ice at all or maybe like a meter of ice or something, uh, whereas a full-on icebreaker is you know fully ice classified. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, if, if you're looking at going through ice penetration, it, it definitely really impacts. That's actually, um, icebreakers are actually a really rough ride in open water because the hull's made for ice, not it's water. It's made to flex too, isn't it? Like the hull flexes a little bit when it hits with the ice? I think, so actually, so a lot of icebreakers, um, I was on the Swedish, uh, the Odin, a couple of years back, we did a project and a lot of icebreakers will actually they'll actually ride up on top and they'll use just the weight of the hull to actually fracture the ice. And then you almost have, yeah. it's not a, you know, super pleasant experience, <laughs> but um, the ship will ride up and then the ice will snap. And um, it's basically, it's almost like using a hammer. Oh, okay. Great. But um, there is a, uh, there is another expedition. So the, uh, there's a, federal uh, project for called the Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute and uh, which is a NOAA initiative to explore the US uh, exclusive economic zone but one of the uh, similar vessel the Okeanos Explorer yeah. which is a similar mission to Nautilus um, they are they're doing some work in Alaska I think they're they're not really fully ice rated but they do have some of those capabilities they Thank were working you, this summer in ice-free waters uh, off the Aleutians. All right, so we have a question about how deep are we currently, and we're currently at 891 meters. Okay. 
And another viewer is asking if there's anything in particular we're looking for or trying to find at this dive site. So Dan, do you want to give a little lowdown again about our dive objectives? Sure. Right now our dive objectives are to find, you know, we're, we're, we're working to look at the coral density and see how it changes as you go from deep to shallow. So as we move up here, um, we found, you know, with yesterday, most of the corals are on outcroppings, 